Steve. Uh, just to follow on, on, on Rob's question, the, the, the night buses, are, are they operating anywhere else from the city out into the other areas or is it, was it, was it just the one? Um, that operator withdrew that service. I don't think that affected any other any other part of the um, of the city region. I'm not certainly. Um, so, if you're asking whether withdrawing that service only affected the rural, then the answer would be yes, because they were only operating that that service. Sorry, perhaps the question was wrong. Do, do, are there other night buses in other parts not going to the world from the Um the, There won't be many, and if they are, there will be commercial services, um, not Mersey Travel supported services. I'd like, I'd like to raise an issue. Part of our levy, and this is a Liverpool City region issue, I understand that. But why we give bus passes out? I'm trying to get I'm trying to get you not to have a bus pass now, Steve. In 18 months. Why why have we chosen to give bus passes out at age 60? Now I think it's it's men and women, so it's an equal playing field. I'd like to say, but it seems like an arbitrary figure, an arbitrary age. Why have we chosen 60? If we if in these times of austerity. We could save money, not just this borough, but all the other boroughs, if we started giving bus passes out on retirement, whatever age that might be. So could, I, could you make a comment about why is it 60, why is it 59 or 61 or 62, but somebody somewhere has decided, oh, 60 is a good age. And I, I've benefited from it in the last four and a half years. Um, so could you... Help us out there, John, please. Uh, I can, yeah, uh, I think. Um, I've not been with Mercy Travel for more than three years, and this predates me. And I have found that there are quite a lot of um, reasons for things that seem to be lost in the midst of time. But <laughs> I, as I understand it, and this does make sense, a certain amount of sense, it was originally um, retirement age, but when the retirement age for women was reduced to 60, was felt that it was discriminatory to have two different ages for entitlement. So then it was reduced to 60, but as retirement age has gone up and up, it does seem um, to a certain extent to be anomalous, anomalous, but it's a combined authority decision to the, the policy on concession and travel. That is an area that, um, well, as you, you've intimated, is probably an area that when we look at it, it's how the policy choices is, is one that you know we would have to demonstrate about the continued value for money of. I was just going to help out there. I was going to help out Chair because I was actually on the Mersey Travel Board at the time. I was one of those members who voted for equality uh, in the census. Uh, and that was a good thing. Very succinctly put, it was exactly that because it was uh, seen by. Uh, certain members of your policy that have been discriminated against the male part of the population. Oh, I, I fully concur with the, the review and looking at it, taking into account that uh, pensionable age is now moving at its pace and we're all living uh, longevity and a lot longer lives. But our members, our current members on the Integrated Transport Authority should uh, have a good look at this and review it properly. Yes, I think the Liverpool City Region, the scrutiny team are, are certainly going to have a look at it. I've got one other, one other issue, um, and it's purely personal. I, I don't go to Liverpool much these days, but when I do go over, it's on match day, whenever they're at home. <laughs> now, I've got a fast tag. Now, what, what the tunnel has started doing because of the... It's very busy, and I'm sure it's the same when Liverpool are at home. But well, what they've done is, now we, the fast tag is brilliant. I think the days of taking money in the Mersey Tunnel should be over in this age of technology. But what you've done is, instead of putting more fast tag lanes in, both going over to Liverpool and coming back, you've taken them away completely. Now, the fast tag is a great idea. There's a big discount. It's, it's very worthwhile financially. But what I... 
suggested, instead of taking the fast tags away, yeah. you should be showing the motorists who are turning off the benefits of having a fast tag by people like me just driving through. Yeah. So, could you have a look into that, please? Because it's it, it's it's galling, really, when you're taking the trouble and other yeah. people are not. So, please, if you could get yeah. Can I just ask a quick, yes, sir, a very yeah. quick point? I've actually looked at fast tag myself. I don't go into them all that much. One thing that put me off, which I assume puts a lot of people on, is there's a minimum. Yeah, exactly. And that, I wouldn't spend, I think it's £20 a month. If you could just get one for £5, £10, I'd probably, there's a lot more people to get. Yeah. It really, what we should have is like the Oyster card. So that's to be noted, and we'll move on to item number 
Number six. Now, Kevin. Yeah. Kevin. Kevin had to go today um, under difficult circumstances. Um, I, I think is. Yes, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, just to say, Kevin would have been here tonight to talk to you about the devolution uh, item on the agenda, but unfortunately, family bereavement means that he's, um, he's just currently um, away from work. So, what I propose him to do is just give you a very brief update on the devolution uh, process. Uh, Kevin may give you more detail than I have because he's been more involved in the detail. Um, and then we'll get a copy of the report that went to the Liverpool City Region uh, Combined Authority on the 2nd of September, um, because I don't think that's been circulated yet to members as far as aware. Um, and as obviously with Kevin's situation, um, we, we'll just um, make arrangements for that to happen to you tomorrow, so I apologise for that, but I just hope you can understand the, um, the circumstances. Um, so just very briefly then, there was a special meeting of the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority on the 2nd of September and they at that meeting considered the um, proposals uh, that have now been put in to government around the devolution of powers and funding for the Liverpool City Region. Um, there are three main core principles uh, which are in play here. The first is to deliver accelerated economic growth and improved productivity. Uh, the second is around local service design and public sector reform. And the third is around improved social outcomes and better health and well-being for local residents. Um, the submission was made on the 4th of September and last week I understand there was a meeting uh, with Greg Clark, who's the minister responsible uh, for the devolution agenda in London and his initial response to the asks from the city region um, was positive um, nothing has been ruled out in terms of what has been requested so far what he did say though was that the uh, number of asks was fairly extensive across a number of policy areas and uh, in all likelihood it wouldn't really be possible to introduce all of those in one go and so the proposal that's likely to emerge from that will be some kind of phased introduction um, of um, the, uh, the devolution asks over, over a period of months. Um, I think it's important just to emphasise that you know, the devolution deal um, is meant to <coughs> ensure that there's greater local flexibility and power to implement, influence decision making um, over significant areas within this city region without having that um, responsibility done by national government. Now things are moving quite quickly at the moment but there is some way to go on the negotiations and discussions and uh, as things develop and the uh, proposals become firmed up they will need to come back both to the, um, uh, the local city region combined authority and also to the individual constituent councils uh, for consideration uh, before those are actually signed up to. Um, so I'll say I'll circulate the, um, the report that went to the, uh, the City Region Combined Authority and um, we'll give to you tomorrow. Um, and that hopefully is just a useful update for you on, on where things are. I'm happy to try and answer any questions if you've got them, but my slight disadvantage is I've not been involved in the detailed discussions because Kelly and, um, and the Chief Executive have let on those things. The process of devolution uh, of these areas of local government to uh, combine authority is probably one of the most important, if not the most important, change in over 40 years in local government. And for a report to come to us of this area, I'm not very
should lead to better atrocities, but the difficulties within their better atrocities is common. And that's the opinion of them. The vote of deficit misses. I think it's disgraceful. And said, I don't have any support for any decision that is taken. Um, it was a very, very short time scale. Um, 
here for this submission, which, which was set by government. And the combined authority only met two days before the date of the submission, and they were still making changes um, up until uh, almost the 11th hour before that submission was made. A general point, and it's not a political point, I, I don't think probably it was a perfect <coughs> process, but it was the process that was set. Um, the submission had not been made by the city region. Uh, Councillor Sullivan's point is right that it would have been some considerable time before there would have been even another opportunity to actually enter that debate. And I think the view that was taken was it was better to try and enter the debate now, um, and, albeit um, in, in very short timescale terms, so that there actually was in there and there's a discussion and debate that could be had and going on. It doesn't mean to say at the end of the day, and this is something the city region and the constituent authority will sign up to, uh, but it does mean that we're in there with the debate and the discussion, and there is the opportunity uh, to um, seek these devolved uh, powers and budgets if, if that's what um, you know the political will is across the city region amongst the constituent uh, councils, if that helps. Um, mine's more of a, a local question uh, than a regional question. Um, obviously, up under 15.2 on page 25, it says, as part of the Council's five year plan of proposals in this report, support the following pledges, which include rural residents and healthier lives. Um, I'm just conscious of the amount of flooding that there has been in August uh, this year and August last year um, throughout the borough. <coughs> And I'd really like to have um, some assurances that, um, as a council, um, that we will be looking into these issues that people are having. You know, the, we're on national TV on documentaries, um, some of us are. <laughs> um, you know, like, it's just really an assurance regarding um, you know, that particular problem. From uh, obviously, I, I can see from the river bed, but when it's empty, that it's got lots of like litter and um, all sorts of um, uh, debris that you know, I feel personally could be removed to, to help with this situation. And I'd just really like the officer's comments on that, please. I'll, I'll try and answer Councillor Winch's um, question. I mean, the Sorry. Yeah, for, for, for you, Chair, the, uh, I think the next item on the agenda, we've got uh, Jeanette and Brian who are coming forward to, uh, to talk about the Climate Change Annual Progress Report. So, uh, the reference from Councillor Lynch is actually the next item for that. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Oh, sorry, 
change strategy, we're talking about adapting to changes. And clearly there's also a question of um, responding to immediate issues so that, that there is a, a connection but, but there are also uh, different so improving resilience to, to when, when things happen and um, at our next um, climate change meeting we've actually got or we've invited the uh, authorities community resilience officer to talk to us about the severe weather plan which is another dimension to it um, there's a Colleagues working in technical services on the drainage plan and all the duties we have under that as well. So all, all those aspects are going on. Some of them are statutory driven. We have to have certain plans and functions in place. Um, and then the climate change work is kind of picking up bits between those statutory things, if you like. So that, in the strategy is an objective about um, porous surfaces in landscape and gardens like that to, to slow runoff. So all, all of these things are connected but it, it is confusing because the, it, 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 there are lots of different ways this is, these are being tackled. Um, the local climate impact profile for example, uh, one of the issues with climate change is most people think it's a, a future issue. Whereas the purpose of a local climate impact profile is to show that actually weather events already have an impact and we should be thinking about what they mean. The Resilient Parks project is a, is a really good example of that where it's taken a, we already, these five parks have, have issues, all, all, all sorts of different issues, so we need to bring all the stakeholders together to think about well, if, this, if this is an example of something that's going to happen more often in the future, what can we learn? now and how can we start applying that learning beyond the other answer your question? In part, yeah. Um, I think so like my main concern is uh, with houses that are be being flooded and um, in some areas across the borough we have the rainwater drainage and sewage merging uh, points on it. I know that was certainly the issue uh, for Reedville Grove and Lisa uh, at one point in time and there are other areas within um, my own ward which, um, you know, this is, this is the situation where you've got two lots of, of drainage coming together and, you know, I'm just wondering if, it, if it's something that we're looking at in the future due to the heavy rains that we're having and again, you know, I'm talking about it was always still not talking about winter here where these issues are, are occurring. Uh, with your permission, Chair, between David and myself, we'll probably chip in and pick up a few points. I think um, as Brian started to touch on just some of the headlines are around, um, as we've seen in the recent flooding, one of the complications is that very often there are different partners and agencies involved. So uh, sometimes it can be for the rivers, the environment agency, we have the sewer network can be on the United Utilities. Council can have an interest certainly from a highways point of view. Um, but importantly, cutting across all of that, uh, the council has the very important statutory role of, as the lead local flood authority. So despite all these different partners' interests, we do have that very important coordinating role. There's a whole body of legislation behind that, but one of the key things that we need to do is keep uh, a very close eye on uh, all of the, the border and where we're getting these flooding hotspots and those kind of issues and make sure that we have plans and strategies to address those problems. Certainly even, uh, I think you'll have seen from the emails from Mark Campbell in the last week or so, that when we do get a major flooding incident like we had uh, a week or so ago, we actually do a very careful lessons learned in the review of all the circumstances behind that. So I think really just to provide them with some reassurance that um, on an ongoing basis we have that statutory duty as a council picked up by uh, my officers uh, to make sure that we do that. Clearly this ties in very, very closely as Brian said with this climate change action plan and this, this agenda in terms of addressing some of these points of source. And then I think David, just from a planning point of view, 
in terms of planning applications for the various things that we do as well? Uh, yes, ju just briefly, we uh, work very extensively with the environment agency on the various foot zones. And um, I suppose the basic and simple position is the, those areas that are uh, prone to the greatest flooding, we don't normally usually um, support development in those areas for, for very obvious reasons. Uh, where there are uh, flood risks, then the range of mitigating measures that we would look for development to put in place, obviously, to try and reduce uh, any impact should, uh, should flood take place. But it is quite a serious issue in various parts of the world. Uh, you know, one, as Mark says, that we look at very carefully uh, and very regularly um, because we wouldn't want these uh, things, obviously, to happen to any families like uh, just happened recently. Yeah. I was just going to finish it, if you don't mind. Um, just um, really to say that I think what I'm looking for is assurance rather than reassurance for the, for the people of Wirral that their home's not going to be flooded. Okay. Um, I've got a question for Mark. Um, Tracy, then Dave, and then John. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to say that I'm really pleased to see that Rural Council is currently investigating and adopting a system to ensure the surplus items are shared within the council, local schools and the community and voluntary sector, and that's a really good idea. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Dave? Uh, thank you, Chair. Very comprehensive report. Fully supports every action that's in it. I'm delighted many years ago I started the, work, the, the Flood Working Party on this authority which has grown and grown, I and mean, it was one of the hardest things we did as an authority, and I'm very pleased that officers have continued to press with it, because the very first thing was United Utilities, the environment agents were happy to come along as long as you may get attacked, but the United Utilities definitely didn't want to come along. When they realised we wanted to work as a partnership together to improve it for everybody, then they come on board, and I'm very happy to say the working party is a very good one. Missed the last one, unfortunately, was an aspect of that thing. But it is an excellent vehicle that we've got, we've started. And we are actually, I would say, the vanguard as far as the emergency side comes in, in relation to flood working and the work that we're doing. So it's something that I'm very proud of and I'm pleased about, that, that we are doing and it. it's working very well. There's so many different things that involve it. But the one thing we've got no control over is the weather. And that's the one thing that we really don't worry about. The thing that saddens me more than anything is the present government has decided not to help the environment with friendly ways of gaining energy to make it better and safer for us. Yeah. And uh, it's something that we have to live with, unfortunately. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on a point that Nita raised earlier on about and also the points that David has raised. Uh, but certainly in Maryland, the Burkhead's at the bottom of four and three is at times completely dry. I just looked at times and it's a big clear to me that the Lord only knows the last time it was. This leads to the Lord and it leads to all sorts of measures. Uh, and I really would like, uh, since we have a good thing coming up in the next few weeks, if we could have a report to that. On that side, probably uh, uh, if we want to, uh, uh, as to what steps we've taken to deal with the many complaints that have been lodged around it, to my knowledge. So uh, that would be one of the way. Thank you, John. Steve. Thanks, Chair. Uh, again, following on from what Anita said there, I mean, our world is one of the worst hits with the flooding. Um, it's still ongoing, but uh, I don't know. People are aware tomorrow morning, community centre, there is a drop in with um, council officers and the environment agency because, yeah, that's a one to seven, between one and seven, there's a drop in tomorrow. And also, um, officers have arranged a meeting for uh, our, myself and the two ward councillors for Monday, again with the environment agency because we feel there's um, sort of time. Time? No, what, what time? On Monday. Yeah, but the one tomorrow is one to seven. And Monday is, I think it's in the afternoon sometime. But that's not an opening, a meeting, is it? It's not an opening. Um, 
what one of the main concerns is the environment agency, which we're going to be take, taking them to task on. Uh, they were even on the television yesterday telling us that, uh, that they'd cleared the river well before. We've got photographs from quite a few of our residents, which we're going to be presenting to them, um, showing that the river totally clogged up with reeds, as, as well as your Coca Cola cans and everything. Yet they're telling us they've cleared it about two days before the floods. So, yeah, we, we can't um, affect the weather, I agree with that, but we can certainly do some prevention stuff. And I think at the moment, from what I'm hearing, the Environment Agency have got a lot to answer rather than the council. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think just in relation to Wirral South, I mean, Wirral South suffered badly, you know, in the uh, last few weeks. And, but I mean, one thing that concerns me is it's the same areas of flooding that were, uh, you know, that uh, it's flooding spots that are coming back every time there's heavy rainfall. And one for me is the bottom of Stan uh, Stanley Avenue uh, on that road. And, you know, with, with the amount of complaints we put in over the years in relation to the flooding there, and still, uh, uh, you know, nothing is being resolved. And I know it's always this ping pong battle between United Utilities and ourselves. But I would, I, would, I would like to uh, make particular notes of the problems that are uh, regularly happening there. And it was much worse this time than the problems in uh, the, the, uh, the footing in the previous, uh, you know, previous times. Thanks for that. Yes, I'd, I'd just like to add to that. that in, in my ward, in, in Pensby, there was extensive flooding on Pensby Road. And one of the members here said before, it's the same places every year. And there's a block of shops, which it, it, it really does worry me and it concerns me. But it's, I don't think it's, it's a blame game as such. We can always say there's improvements can be made, and improvements can always be made. But my concern is the age of the drains. Last year's flooding, this row of shops on Pensby Road, the bottom of Rosemary, was flooded out. We came along, we did a really good job, we pumped the drains out, and we did all that you would expect. But exactly the same flooding happened again this year. But it's down to the age of the drains. They're just now, and I think it's a problem right throughout the country. I personally think it should be a problem that should be dealt with by central government. Because local government, you know, local councils, we just haven't got the money anymore. And that's a problem with maintenance. Um, so, it, it is a very real, real concern and worry, but it's down to the age, the age of the drains, I think, is one of the things. Thank you, and thanks for an excellent report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I refer members to page 22, 3, 4, 5, Better Food, Where All. And in particular, on the action plan, page 51. Three, um, just as a point of information, uh, I have been a volunteer with all farms marketing youth ferry in my ward for the last 15 years. Uh, however, the action plan refers to West Cave farmers market, which is a new kid on the block. Uh, there's actually a farmers market in Liscard, and there's one in Heswell. And I'm just wondering why A, the action plan maybe refers to um, West Kenby Farmers Market. There have been other farmers markets, one in Eastern, um, in Councillor Mitchell's ward, which sort of started with the um, oil aid, another one. Um, so there are other farmers markets uh, around. I mean, one of the initiatives that Whittle Farmers Market took to public health about was providing vouchers at their cost, as in the farmer's market.